Hello and welcome to Season 2 of the Art and Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Carol Cram, a novelist and avid reader of books inspired by the arts. This episode features Lynn Cullen, author of Thwain's End and Mrs. Poe in the literature category. Lynn Cullen's novels have received numerous awards, including a People Magazine Book of the Week and an Oprah Book of the Week for Mrs. Poe, and a People Magazine Book of the Week and Indie Next Selection for Twain's End. Lynn's novels have been translated into 17 languages, and she has appeared on PBS's American Masters. She lives in Atlanta with her large family when not on the road researching her next book. Welcome to the Art and Fiction Podcast, Lynn. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. So first off, I am in awe of your novels. I love the way in which you combine fact and fiction, you know, the way you write about the interactions of real historical figures with larger than life people like Edgar Allan Poe and Mark Twain, who's my particular favorite. So today we're going to focus on two, on art and fiction, Twain's End and Mrs. Poe, both of which are listed in the literature category. So let's start by talking about Twain's End. So could you give us a quick overview of Twain's End? I always like an underdog, and I like that Twain had this tragic childhood and that he was always trying to prove himself. It's actually Poe is the same deal. Maybe all great writers are the same, have the same uh, issues that they're trying to prove themselves and try to be loved. Anyhow, this is Twain's need to be greatly loved, and he created this persona, Mark Twain. Mark Twain's not a person, that's his pen name. It's Samuel Clemens. And, you know, the more I read about him, the more I I found that really intriguing, that Mark Twain is this dream person. It's not Samuel Clemens at all. And that, you know, that hooked me. But then what I read about in his later life, how he had the secretary, Isabel Lyon, she was everything to him. She was the perfect secretary. She didn't just do secretary stuff. She ran his life, his social calendar. She dealt with the reporters. She built his house. She built his house. So here she went from being everything to him and even managing his daughter's affairs for him, for her. And then all of a sudden he turned on her and in a major way, he dragged her through the mud, said the most vile, just almost unimaginably vile things about her in the press. And, you know, I wondered what turned him against her and he never changed. He never recanted. And the funny thing is she never took him to task for it. Her husband did, tried to briefly, but uh, she died alone and reviled in a little basement apartment in Greenwich Village, you know, years later. In fact, Hal Holbrook knew of her and contacted her, and that's how Hal Holbrook developed his Twain act. I remember seeing Hal Holbrook quite a few years ago do his Twain act. That was amazing. And he got his mannerisms from um, talking to Isabel Lyon. So I was just intrigued by who was this woman who was everything and and how Holbrook even knew enough to consult her. Who was she that she went from everything to nothing for him? Why was that? And that's what got me going in the story. I found that, you know, he's a deeply troubled man. People who really admire him will probably be shocked. Yes, I, well, I wasn't shocked because I have actually done a lot of research about Sam Clemens and Mark Twain. As I told you before, I, I did my thesis on him many, many moons ago. So I did know that there was a big difference between the two. And actually, I, I think it was fascinating that you explored that so much because you know, maybe it was this complexity that made him so compelling as a writer. You know, this this disparate, these two people. Probably so. And I mean, and he wrote some great things and had some great thoughts. He had this, this side that was so tender and, uh, you know, a champion for the, the little man. He always was. He didn't suffer fools. I mean, I really, there's a lot of things I really admire about him. And yes, and so that makes it even more poignant that the man is so flawed too. And I remember when I was studying him, actually the works that I loved the most was the ones that he wrote towards the end. And you actually touch on those sometimes in the novel, his really dark satires. He was such an anomaly, wasn't he? Because sometimes he was very tender and and almost sentimental. And other times he was just raging. Right. We're more quick to um, apply a 
a DSM label on people these days, but I suppose he's bipolar. What do you think? Oh, yes. I I was thinking that all the way through. What would he be? Would he be a narcissist? Would he be bipolar? Would he be manic depressive? I don't know. He would, yeah, we'd give him some kind of label. But he was also a genius, you know, for, for the, his work is wonderful. How do we reconcile that? I think we're actually having that problem a lot lately, aren't we? Like reconciling the bad things they did in their lives because, you know, he was not a particularly nice dad, was he, <laughs> with his girls? No. This makes me think of when I was at um, Twain House, the Mark Twain House in uh, Hartford, and I was in the little uh, bookshop that they have there with, with every book that he's ever written, and it's a great little bookshop. I was going to speak there, and some guy came up to me and said, I guess he'd read my book, and he said, are all geniuses uh, horrible people? <laughs> and, you know, at the time I said no, but, you know, I, I think there might be something to that, you know. Um, there's very few who are tender, wonderful people, you know, all the way through. Though I have to admit that I, as the older I get, and, you know, I've, it's been a few years since this book's come out, six years, I actually have more sympathy for him than I, than I did. I was mad at him about Isabel Lyon, to tell you the truth. He was so awful to her, and she did not deserve that because he was jealous of her, of her getting married. I really do believe that's why he went ballistic on her. It wasn't right. But what I do appreciate more and more, as he got older, he was more and more disappointed with humans. He, you know, he even was afraid that everybody would think he was a misanthropist, and he was a misanthropist. <laughs> but, but I, he was right. You know, he saw these foibles and he called them out. And I, I appreciate that as I, as I age, I'm getting to be, I guess, less able to suffer fools too. Also, I think it's really good that that we do acknowledge the complexity of life, as we were talking about earlier. I mean. He, he was a great writer. He was also not a great guy all the time. Sometimes he was. That's life. You know, I think we want everything to be too uh, simple in a way, but things are complicated. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that's really important um, for all my characters that I don't want them to, I don't want people to expect anyone to be perfect. And when you're writing about famous people, I wish people didn't have these expectations that made these people godlike. They're people. They're just like us. They just happen to have something catch, like Poe, for example. I don't even know if some people call him a genius, and I don't know. He did kind of um, really introduce a genre with his, you know, detective stories, and he was such a good psychological writer. But um, like The Raven, for example, I don't find a work of sheer genius, and I don't think he did at first. And after a while, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to be a genius. Yeah, so let's talk about um, Mrs. Poe, which, of course, is about a a romance between uh, Francis Osgood and Edgar Allan Poe. Well, sort of a long, drawn-out one. (laughs) So what was the genesis of uh, that novel? Well, like I said, every novel comes from a question that I'm trying to answer. It's back in the recession, the Great Recession, and... I had some books under contract, and because of the recession and everything, uh, they d- I didn't have this publisher I was with um, want the book that I was working on. And I was in this office that I'm sitting in here, looking at my books, thinking oh, I've, I've got to I've got to write something. I need a feisty heroine because that's what they told me they didn't like about my book. The the heroine wasn't feisty. I was in here thinking, feisty heroine, feisty heroine. And it had to be someone from history because I love, you know, doing these famous people and, and, you know, like getting down to the bottom of them. Poe popped up in my head and I hadn't a single Poe book in my shelves. I don't even know why Poe popped in my head. But I ran over to uh, my computer because there was like alarm bells were ringing. And I looked him up and I saw that um, he was very poor he was orphaned, unloved by his foster family, and he he was trying to prove himself with his writing. And finally, in 1845, with The Raven, he all his dreams came true. He was like the most famous guy in 
really writer in the world. People knew him around the world. Kids followed him on the street, pretending like they were ravens. They did parodies of the raven. Even um, Abe Lincoln wrote a parody of, of the raven. It's called the pole cat. Anyhow. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So here he was all of a sudden huge. And, you know, within one year's time, he lost it all. He was kicked out of society. He was, you know, the society's darling. He was asked to, you know, go to all the, the literary parties. You know, he was kicked out of every everybody's home. And he ended up with his uh, wife dying, you know, in uh, Fordham, New York, you know, in the Bronx now. is the countryside then. And uh, I thought, what made this guy go from having everything to nothing in one year's time? So I was reading around and I saw that in that year, some people thought perhaps he had an affair with Frances Osgood. And I thought, oh, okay. And so I looked her up and I saw that she was a, essentially single. She was married, but her husband had abandoned her. He was a portrait painter and he tended to bed the women that he painted and would just take off and leave his wife and, and two children. And so she was trying to support her family with her writing, which, you know, it's not so easy for women now to support their families with writing. It's really hard. And then, but back then it was unheard of. So here she was doing this. And when I read about her trying to make a go of it with her writing, the hair just stood up on my arms. I just thought, I know you, I know you. And I, I wrote that book. It just was like a, a dream. It came fairly quickly. Um, and it was just, it was really a turning point in my career. It was just such fun too. I just had so much delight in discovering New York from that period. I think that's what comes out in it too, is that I, I kind of could feel that you were enjoying writing that book, you know, the way you described New York. And also it's very well plotted and, you know, these little bits that you have in there from um, Edgar Allan Poe's stories. I know his stories better than his poetry. Uh, years ago, I used to teach the stories because they were always on the curriculum. Uh, you know, the telltale heart and the pit and the pendulum. And the way those you worked those in here and there was really clever. And, and I just sort of felt that as an author, you were enjoying yourself. And that really came through. It sounds like you were. Thanks. I was enjoying myself because it really was great fun to write. I don't know. It just all came, you know, I felt like, thank you, whoever you are above, for dropping this on me. This was your breakout novel, wasn't it? Because you'd already written several before. Yeah. So that's encouraging news for authors. You just never know which novel is going to be the one. Of course, one of the most interesting characters I found in the novel was the character of Mrs. Poe, Virginia, uh, who's such a child, but you know, also very much suffering. She she was fascinating. And um, first off, why did you call the novel Mrs. Poe? Well, <clears throat> because I felt like it was the, the two of them, I guess competing, but the, both of them wanting to be Mrs. Poe. And like, who is the real Mrs. Poe? Because Virginia, you know, married him when he was young and well, when she was super young, when she was 13. But they were both kind of desperate. It was a, a marriage to cling to each other. Actually, her mother, well, I should say her cousin, she had a wealthy cousin who was going to take her and raise her as his ward because she was still young enough to you know, be a ward. But at that time, little Edgar, he, little, he was in his 20s. He was afraid he was, well, Edgar was living with um Virginia and her mother, and he thought oh, this is, he's going to lose her. The only way to keep her would be to marry her. So it was very, it was not the usual thing to marry at 13. Some people think, oh, back then they married younger. 13 was a little young. To make it your cousin, even weirder. So, so, but it was just because I think he loved her as a sister. He called her sis. And, and I think um, that was their relationship, even though I think Virginia from what I could tell, though very little is known about her, but I imagine her just being crazy in love with her older dashing cousin because he was not gloomy and ugly in the, when he was young. You know, when we, the pictures we're so familiar with, 
or when the man was dying. That's never a good look for anybody. And um, so when he was young and, and so handsome and, you know, so smart and she just adored him, you know, she was the legal Mrs. Poe, but Francis was really more in his league. You know, she was a poet and I just imagine that the two of them just really got each other. And, you know, if, if he had married later, he, he would have married her, but he was already married. So that's why, you know, it's Mrs. Poe. Like, who is the actual Mrs. Poe? Yes, that's what I was thinking when I was reading it. And I was thinking poor old Virginia Poe must have been so incredibly jealous, which, of course, is what you did bring through. Yes. And, you know, this is a, a, a point in the favor of going places, you know, uh, going to the scenes of your books. I, I knew that she was jealous, but I went to where she lived on, um, I believe it's 4th Avenue in uh, no, 4th Street in um, Greenwich Village. I went to where they lived. It's still there. You can go. Actually, all that's left is like the banister of the stairway. <laughs> it's part of NYU now. But you can go to where that building is. And I looked down the street. I looked up to where um, Francis Osgood was staying. Virginia could look out her window and see him go in there. And when I saw, when I looked out and saw, it's just, you know, a matter of uh, six houses or so and around the corner that she, you know, she could have actually seen him pretty much disappear into that house. It broke my heart for her. How awful to see your husband every night, you know, whistling off to uh, Bartlett is the Bartlett's house. And and the reason I knew that there was actually an affair, because a lot of people, um, Poe po scholars, some people say, no, there was no affair. But it was um, Mr. Bartlett saying, yes, when Francis Osgood was staying with us that summer, every night Poe would come and stay until after midnight. And I thought, woo, you know, things happen after midnight. So <laughs> that was... That was pretty telling. That and the letters, it's recorded how there were letters that were at least um, uh, Francis's friends believe that there were letters that Francis and Poe exchanged because they wanted those letters back when the affair came to light. They wanted to save Francis's good name and um, get those letters back. So I think back in the in the day, I think everybody knew about this affair and there was no doubt. And that's what got him kicked out of society. And actually one of the elements though, of both of your novels that really fascinated me is how you depict the complexity of romance. I mean, both of your heroines love complicated men. I mean, their romances are not straightforward. So what are you wanting to communicate about the nature of love with these novels? Well, I think one thing that goes through my mind is how, we are so attracted, you know, we're, we're animals. It sounds terrible. We're organisms. We're organisms. We're animals. We have drives. And I think it, it works on us all the time that we're attracted to people. Um, it's just part of being an animal. And I think that's why we have so many rules um, in society. And in my books, people keep running into these these rules and they break them and they get ruined. But those rules are there because there's there, I guess there has to be some kind of order it, because we have these desires all the time. And I just feel like it's just so human to want the wrong person. I think, or, or it's just to, just to want period. Just to want period. Uh, that's very, very true. You know, even though, for both women, these these were not good ideas, these these um, relationships. But all the way through with Mrs. Poe, I, I kept thinking, really, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not going to end well. And, <laughs> but she couldn't help herself. I mean, she, she loved him so much. And the same with Isabel and um, Samuel Clemens, even though, you know, as, as you said, even at the very end, when he was so awful to her, she didn't ever speak badly of him, did she? No, never. And, you know, I ended up making that constant craving, which that 
that's the title of one of my all-time favorite songs by um Katie Lang. K D Lang. Yes. Good Katie girl. Yeah. K D, yes, Katie Lang. Anyhow, I love that song, Constant Craving, because I feel like that is the core of our existence, what we fight about. I don't know why why we have this, but it's part of us. And we can never be happy with what we have. We always are craving something else. And I think this you see this in every book I write. It's like the core of every book I write. And it became even more like the um, my last one out, The Sisters of Summit Avenue. It's played out because it's about advertising a lot and how advertising takes advantage of that craving, you know, that we want more. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, we are never really satisfied as human beings. No, no. And you know how we were talking about how we don't read our novels when we're done? We should. We should go back and go, wow, I did this. But being human, you don't. (laughs) You go on to the next. You want the next one. But if there really is something that it should be said about respecting your own work, and I'm the worst offender of that. And, uh, you know, that's just part of that, this whole always looking ahead. We're always looking ahead. And part of that, too, is being hard on ourselves. I don't know about you, but I mean, I've looked at the novels I've written and yeah, yeah, they're fine. But all I can think about is I need to write another one that's better and better. And and whatever I did wasn't good enough. And even if it did well, it it doesn't matter. (laughs) Like we're never satisfied. Exactly. Exactly. And actually, that leads me to a question about the creative process, because that figures prominently as a theme I think in both of these novels and I would imagine in some of your other ones as well the the idea of the creative process of what it takes to create and how sometimes you can't and sometimes it works well how similar was it to your own process what you depicted well actually Mrs. Poe in particular was very honest about what it's like to be a writer at least from my experience there's a line in there about how when something really good comes on the page and, and you know what, I'd never, whenever something really good comes, I never can even claim credit for it. I always like, where did that come from? I'm shocked. And it doesn't happen, but like once a month, you know, it's not all the time, but um, when it happens, I, I describe a scene where Francis has this happen in a poem and it sits, you have to sit back because you feel like, like you open this wound and you have to let it bleed a minute. It's a very physical feeling, you know, when when something's really good those few times. I'm always surprised about where did that come from? Yeah. So we were talking earlier that you would like to do a reading from Mrs. Poe. Uh, yes. And I have a um, passage here from uh, the, the fifth chapter. And it's really just a little shout out to writers this is where Frances is going to meet Poe for the first, well, she's met him before, but this is a, a personal meeting that he has called. So this is 1845 New York. Two weeks later, I was tucked beneath a thick buffalo robe, riding downtown in Miss Fuller's carriage. I had been too nervous to enjoy the trip or to appreciate Miss Fuller's carriage, pulled by a clopping bay, that Miss Fuller was the only woman in New York to support herself by riding let alone to have enough left over to buy her own buggy, mattered little to me at that moment. Why had I agreed to meet Poe? And why would he want to meet me? He had already made and broken an appointment the previous week. I had been relieved by the cancellation, only to become agitated once more when he set up a different date. As suddenly and inexplicably as he had championed my poetry at the New York Society Library, he could withdraw his support If I said something wrong, who knew what triggered the man's tomahawk? Miss Fuller jerked on the reins. Here we are. She looked at me expectantly as if I should climb out of her trim little gig without her. Shouldn't we wait for the doorman to take your reins? I asked. Take my reins? Oh, did you think I was coming with you? No, no, dear. I'm off to investigate a slum on Hester Street. You really thought I was coming with you? I only meant that I would take you here. I thought your husband would appreciate my escorting you since he is, um, as you say, out of town. Would you rather I came with you to the slum, I ask, and have you jilt Mr. Poe? I wouldn't dare. Miss Fuller steadied her horse, then waved me toward the hotel. Go on. 
It will be good for your books. Reluctantly, I climbed out from under the heavy robe. I held my breath as the carriage rattled away. I found myself on the sidewalk before the hotel, contemplating an immediate about face up Broadway when I felt someone's presence behind me. Before I could move, a man said, Lord, help the poor bears and beavers. I turned to find Mr. Poe, his black lashed eyes trained upon the building before us. Without a hello, he said, Davy Crockett's words upon first seeing this pile. I hesitated because of Mr. Poe's fur trade. He continued as if I had not spoken, but Crockett was mistaken. It wasn't the bears and the beavers that made Astor's fortune. It was the opium he bought from the Chinese. I looked at him in surprise. Mr. Astor deals in opium? He kept his gaze upon the hotel. Whenever you see this much wealth, assume that someone has dirtied his hands. Fortunes don't come to saints. I've never thought of that. He gave me a sharp glance. Really? I drew back. Mr. Astor prefers to be known for the slaughter of animals rather than for his association with, association with opiates. I wonder why that is. He lowered his sights to me. Shall we enter, Mrs. Osgood? So he did recognize me. I preceded him inside into the hot maw of the lobby. As we walked past impressive people dressed in beautiful clothes, I felt low and insignificant, a ne'er-do-well's abandoned wife, although my gown was as fi fine as anyone's. What a sham I was. I stopped to face him. Congratulations on the success of the Raven. He frowned as if insulted. People love it. I hear talk of it everywhere I go. People have no taste. Don't tell me you think it's a work of genius. Was this a trick? When I did not answer, he said, thank you, Mrs. Osgood. You're the first honest woman I have met in New York. He shook his head. It is my luck that I will become famous for that piece. Still not sure I shouldn't be gushing. I switched to, to safer ground. May I ask what you're working on now? A book on the material and spiritual universe. I laughed. He watched me coolly. I'm sorry, I thought you were joking. I never joke. Oh, of course not, excuse me. Although I wish I were, it never will sell. Your work always sells. Not any of my works with a true idea in them. People want to be titillated or frightened. They don't want to think. I smiled hesitantly. What did he want with me? This is why I singled out your poem in my lecture, he said. They have real feeling in them if one reads between the lines. I could not help but be disarmed. Thank you. I find that the thoughts spoken between the lines are the most important parts of a poem or story, as in life, he said. Thank you. That was great. I was totally taken back. I remember that scene. I was really struck <clears throat> too when you talked about Mr. Astor and, you know, is there such a thing as a, a wealthy man who didn't get his hands dirty getting his wealth? And that seemed very timely. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got such a kick, too, out of out of the whole thing with the Raven in that novel. I confess I had never read the Raven. And you start the novel with it. You have the entire poem. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't actually see what was so great about it, I have to say. <laughs> I know it's heresy for me to say that in particular, but... You know, it was just catchy. It was very catchy. And never more, never more. And uh, so, yeah, it was interesting because when I first, because I listened to it, of course, listened to it being uh, recited. And I went, okay, this is supposed to be like a really, really great poem. I'm not so sure. And then all the way through the novel, you know, it keeps coming up and he's sort of ambivalent about it himself because it made him famous, but also he doesn't think it's all that great. And Yeah, I, I think that his imp of the perverse is a more honest and interesting piece. That's that's actually my favorite. It's maybe not the most well-written. It's not catchy at all, like The Raven. I, I feel like, again, he captured human nature by saying how, it says in a nutshell, you're your own worst enemy. And why is that? Why, when you have everything? I'm And the empathy for perverse is actually the theory of, of this whole novel because he had everything. And why would you stand on the, the precipice and jump? Why would you when you have 
everything. Why? And he knew better. Um, and and that's what the the story was about. Is you know somebody who did him, his own self in knowing better. There's a lot of guilt and that kind of thing in in a lot of his his stories, which I think is a much more honest thing than the Raven. And I think just seeing the similarities a little bit between Poe and Twain, you know, quite tortured characters and never satisfied. Yeah, they're actually way more alike than I even thought of as I was writing them. It was only afterward I thought they truly have much in common from their child, you know, sad childhoods to their adulation and their own discomfort with their adulation. Though I have to say Poe liked his adulation more than, no, I take it back. You know Twain. He loved being famous. Well, Mark Twain liked it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I take it back. I take that back. And uh, so, do you have one piece of advice for authors? I know that's a big question, but what I'm sure you're asked quite often, you know, what would be your one piece of advice for aspiring writers? To always keep learning. Definitely good advice. <laughs> if something doesn't work, listen to the editor or people, you know, who have looked at your work, if something's not working, listen, listen, uh, two heads are better than one. And uh, I, I just think it really helps to question, you know, where, where you could improve. I've been at this a long time, and I am always questioning, and there's so much to learn. But the learning's fun. So I'm not suggesting something horrible. I'm suggesting, isn't it fun to discover what we have? To embrace the learning. That's and it's really part of of the joy of writing. I know I've heard a few authors say this and I totally agree. What really motivates us is trying to get better and better and better. Maybe that's why we don't like to read our, our books, the, the ones that are already published. We want to go forward. When you discover a piece that works in your book, you've been hitting your head on the wall and it comes to you, that's our reward. Absolutely. That's totally the reward. Yeah, not the publication, not the, you know, the sales. Those are all great, but it's, yeah, it's when it works. Yep. It, yep. That discovery or something that you, a piece that you were missing that you never dreamed of and it pops into everything works out that, I don't know, just the discovery part is our joy. And I, I hope people stick with, with writing because that joy is, I feel sorry for people who don't have it because it's so fun. It is. I know. I know. Thanks so much for chatting with me today, Lynn. This has just been delightful. I've really enjoyed speaking with you too. Great discussion. I hope we get to discuss things in the future. I've been speaking with Lynn Cullen, author of Twain's End and Mrs. Poe in the literature category. Be sure to check the show notes for links to more information about Lynn Cullen. Please follow Art and Fiction on Twitter and Facebook and subscribe to the Art and Fiction podcast and give it a positive review or rating wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening.